I'm Mara Webster with In Creative Company, and I'm so excited today to be joined by the wonderful Jeremy Swift to talk all about Ted Lasso. And in in kind of going back to when you first were cast as Higgins in the show, you know, I feel like Higgins is this amazing enigma where even down to the final episode, there's always moments and, and lines that are dropped from the character that give us these unexpected details about his life, the things that he's interested in, his personality. So he's really continued to build and grow throughout the, the three seasons. And I was interested in, in the process for you in terms of developing a character where you're then being given kind of all these little insights and, and little details along the way and how you set about developing him at the beginning, but then as you get these details details kind of absorb them into who you view him as and, and who you continue to grow him as throughout the series? Well, when I work, I action out things because I think we are what we do and say. So um, it's, it's very difficult to retrospectively think, you know, be aware that this has always been going on in his head. But um, so I, that's how I work the scripts and the scenes. Um, at the same time, you know his the, the mentorship that he seems to have developed uh, and being given license to do is very spontaneous, and I think it's part of his uh, character that he, you know, delivers this stuff a little bit off the cuff. Um, he hasn't um, he hasn't processed a lot of these ideas. It's just. Uh, homespun <laughs> and, uh, and and surprises himself, which I think is the the delight about it. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's been you know um, little things are added, and you you know that, and, and the same with a lot of the characters. It's development. It's great development, and you and you and you see him when he's paired off with a different character, like like. Jamie Tart in season two when he has his makeshift office and when he's um you know mentoring Will about jazz uh there's always a different uh aspect shown and that's what is so great with the show is when there are so many characters in it that you know you can pair off a couple and you'll get a different chemistry every time and it will sh then shine light on a different aspect so yeah we love that <laughs> I, I love that descriptor that you just used of him surprising himself because it's not even just in terms of the mentorship and the advice that he gives people. It feels like sometimes he will try to land a joke in the middle of a conversation that everyone's having and then he'll maybe realize, oh, that didn't quite hit the way I wanted to because I didn't think it out before I interjected. Um, and so I feel like there's a lot of moments and a lot of different ways in which he surprises himself because he he sometimes talks before he considers what he's saying to people. And it's, it's one of the beautiful qualities to watch in him. And so how did you find a lot of the pacing of that delivery and what it looks like to be kind of always kind of jumping into conversations in that way? Uh, well, you just follow the context. And sometimes uh, you're absolutely right. He hasn't read the room properly. Um, for example, when he talks about, um, uh, uh, about Beard's girlfriend, uh, and uh, everybody completely disagrees with him, you know, and he, he's he's very, very, wor he, you know, in season two, he's very worried about that relationship. Um, but it's because it's out of his particular comfort zone. Um, but yeah, he, it's it's one of the few times where his advice is <laughs> is wholeheartedly not accepted. And, and uh, because Ted's very, very um, accommodating and and you know usually goes for you know right until the 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 last diamond dog scene in in this season finale you know ted take it takes on board what he says you know very warmly um so yeah there's a it, but i love that it just shows there's no it's it there's, there's no repeti repetitiveness <laughs> about his uh about the way he behaves you know it just it just we're all fallible you know yeah. And is there something quite fun in kind of finding the different ways in which he sometimes tries to walk himself back a little bit? Like if the joke doesn't land, how is he going to recover in the moment? Is he going to stay quiet? Is he going to try and physically extricate himself from the room entirely? Um, and just kind of finding yeah. those different angles to play around with. Yes, there is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Uh, and, you know, the writers relish making uh, Higgins an awkward figure as well. So it just gives other dimensions to, you know, the playing of him. Yeah. 
And he's got such a combustible kind of infectious energy to him as well. Was that something that you kind of really connected to early on and kind of found in terms of just the pacing and the rhythm and the movement of the character because it tracks into the physical side as much as the dialogue for him? Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think he's opened up, I think in episode two of the first season, you know, when Ted says, you know, Higgins and I having um, uh, lunch together and uh, he suddenly allowed, I think that's one of the first times, certainly in front of Rebecca, he's allowed to sort of, you know, explode a bit with happiness. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that's, that's, you know, the whole show is about the, um, the improvements on from the back foot the, and, the, the, and the warmth that Ted has and upping everybody's game in all the different ways and just making them more human and uh, better people. Uh, so it, it, everybody's developed in different ways and some people it takes a lot longer. You know, Roy, it takes forever <laughs> and you don't know whether he is still there, but you know, there are certainly cracks in there and, and he's allowing himself to feel and, and, uh, and, you know, appreciate people, um, for example. Uh, but yeah, it, it, that's, I, I've loved doing that. And it's been great to, um, to do a bit of physical stuff as well as the, uh, the, you know, the, the lines that I've been gifted, which are, you know, just fabulous. And and I've heard you talk a lot about kind of the the big pivot for him at the beginning of season one, where it was, you know, Rebecca really wanted him to be her right hand in terms of being a foil to Ted. And he really resigned himself from that and was like, this isn't what I'm going to do. And that kind of really set him into a completely different space and, and kind of cemented this sense of confidence in him. And so when you first started playing him, how did that kind of really set off the foundation for a lot of the confidence and self-assertion that you've built into him over the three seasons? well you know pretty much from the get-go and there's a lot of comedy that's got out of it that he's not only is he not com comfortable being a spy he's really really bad at it because he does have a moral compass and uh and he, you know it, it's it's spinning when he's doing that and he can't find a direction so yeah, it's um, <laughs> he just can't do it, and I think that's that's as as much as anything as as well as the moral stance. He, he literally physically is not capable of, you know, organizing such multi layered betrayal, and he does feel guilty, and you know, um, and we you know see that when he resigns in the first season, uh, and because it's never addressed until that moment, until that moment of critical mass. Um, but yeah, it's great that he's, he had that and that there was a reconciliation um, with Rebecca, which was fun as well. There was, you know, they, they, they were joshing with each other still despite that. And they, they showed their real selves to each other. And that, you know, it was such a great choice from the writers. Yeah. And, and you mentioned that he's a terrible spy, but he's a wonderful gossip and very attuned yes. to kind of paying attention and listening to everything going on around him, whether it's the trail of people that give him the gossip about Zava or even when Rupert's in the papers at the end and him telling Rebecca, you know, what's the gossip, the juicier, the better. Um, and so did you always want to set him up as kind of being quite observational and, and, and a really astute listener, even if people don't realize that he's paying attention to everything around him? I think, uh, I think he gets comfort with the gossip from from having these female friends from from having you know Keely and and Rebecca uh, and and enjoys you know the juice um, and uh, you know it's valid information and, uh, and it's stuff that he can use and uh, and again I think it's feasible that you know if you hear stuff before the media do then it's it's valuable to you in in that in the world of football you know because it's very brutal when when people move on in in football like it is in politics um you know it can be it's um when somebody's got to has to go they have to go you know um but i love the fact um that he, you know he get, he picks up some gossip from his um from his jazz improv group uh that's such a great idea and that, that, that i love that little line because you just sort of think there's that's another world 
you know, a, a, an, a, an off scene world um, that Higgins has, you know, like this life um, <laughs> jamming with these gossipy jazz friends. It's such a great idea, great image. But I, I, I love as well with what you're bringing up there that he gets to exist in these two kind of very distinctive groups within AFC Richmond. You know, he's got yeah. Rebecca and Keeley and, and that's one ecosystem and dynamic. And then he's got the Diamond Dogs with with the guys in the locker room. Um, and so for you, what, it, what, the, what are the two different versions of Higgins that you find in those two different groups and spaces for him? Um, I think he's somebody who's a great listener in any situation um he has to uh he has to motivate uh rebecca though so he has to be a little bit more dynamic in scenes with her but he with the diamond dogs um well there are different scenes in the locker room of course the, there are scenes where there is information shared and there is still fun um and then the diamond dogs is more reflective and that's about sharing and listening and accommodating and helping. So um, yeah, it's different hats. Yeah. <laughs> and there's obviously great humor when, especially whenever the diamond dogs get together, just the way that wherever Higgins is, if he could be 20 miles away, he will come running immediately. He will climb through a window, he'll jump over fences. Um, and so what, what was that like for you and getting to do so much physical comedy in terms of how is he gonna make sure that he's always inserted and he's always present and he's always there in the center of everything? Well, <laughs> it's just um, exploiting what I can do until somebody tells me to stop. Um, you know, I mean, in um, coming through the window, all it said in the script was Higgins has difficulty climbing through the window. So it was a bit of a <laughs> moment. Uh, uh, and uh, yeah, there were quite a few takes for that. And that... Um, and that was that was kind of re not rewritten on the spot, but um, Jason, Jason said to Nick, just keep saying, go around, go around Higgins, go around. So that wasn't that wasn't in the script, but it's just that as we took so long uh, to do it, you know, it just we became embellished for other people as well, you know. So it's just so fu such fun when you can have those moments. You create them on set, and then and then they end up in the show. It's a joy. Yeah. Did you find that as the show went on and as it progressed that there were more ways to kind of play into the physical comedy of the character? Because even just the recurring thing of him being startled whenever he's holding a cup of tea was something that kind of started coming to the foreground more and more. And it felt like there were more instances of us getting to see that side of, of the comedic sensibility of him. Uh, well, well, those, I mean, it was only two episodes that that happened in. Um, the the the, they haven't totally run with the, the 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 physical stuff because I think if you had too much of it, it won't count so much. Um, but you know, less is more. You know, so um, uh, when it so when it does happen, it it is properly funny, and that it's just it's, it's such a way to make great comedy. It's just to it's just to make it real. You know. Yeah. I mean, and, and off the back of, of that, in terms of with the comedy, it all being about just making it very real, when it comes to the dialogue, is that kind of the central approach for you as well? Because, you know, even if we look at when he's telling Rebecca, okay, my my wife's hairdresser's sister-in-law heard this about Zava, and it's that whole chain of events. It's absolutely hilarious as an audience member, but to Higgins, that's all completely real in his world. And he's very deadly serious about making sure that she has all the details that he thinks exactly, she needs. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it's probably too. <laughs> it well, it clearly is far too much detail. So much detail that it's baffling and uh, unbelievable, <laughs> seemingly unbelievable. Um, yes, I was very ill that day that I had to deliver that line, and I had sort of gastric flu. So I and it was such a long, complicated. I had about two or three little speeches like that with so much information that I ended up not making any sense at all at some point um but yeah yeah he's uh exactly he wants and he's again uh Mara, it, it, excited by the gossip in that scene you know and and wants he wants to be girly and um you know show that show his girly side that he's got all the information at his fingertips 
And I wanted to talk about the Amsterdam episode as well, because it was such a, a, a wonderful episode for him as a character in so many different ways. And, and kind of starting and talking about that friendship with Will was really beautiful to kind of see what is Higgins excited to share? You know, what is he super passionate about in his world that he finally has someone who is not just listening to him talk about it, but is coming along on a, a full journey and a full evening out where he can point out everything that he's interested in, give him the yeah. full history. Um, and so what was that like? <laughs> getting to kind of really bring a lot more of him to the foreground and think about what really excites him to share and then to share it with someone else what that means well it was a delight um and um and i love charlie what charlie's work uh as well it's a it's a, such a fantastic character and you know there is some simpatico uh with him he is a little bit of a mini me uh, and he makes the same sort of uncertain noises. So, so I was interested to see how that would play out. And it, what's great about um, that development in that episode between the two of them is that when when they're actually in the, the club and the, the band start playing um, <laughs> and Higgins starts to bawl, he suddenly he goes and he says, as Miles Davis once said, and Will is, stops him because he's immediately into it. And that's just, and, and then, you know, it allowed me a look to sort of, aha, my job has done, been done here. Uh, so, which is, you know, just a fabulous idea, fabulous creative idea. And, and I believe Brendan was writing on the episode and was the one to come up with the song that Higgins was going to perform on the double bass on stage that night. And yes. it, it's great because it's it's a song that's about kind of letting go of formality and doing something a little bit crazy and unleashing yourself. And so once you knew that was the specific song choice, outside of even just thinking about the performance, how did that kind of set up a lot of the central ethos of, of that episode for you with Higgins? Uh, well... It's really, it, it impacts on everybody, of course. That's, uh, you know, you could almost have a sort of, in another director's hands, possibly not as good as the genius that is Matt Lipsy, you could have almost had a split screen of everybody finding themselves by getting lost, you know, not doing, stepping outside of their comfort zone, literally stepping from land to water, <laughs> in Rebecca's case um because that's what it's about you know if you if j just let go of rigid formalities and find yourself through chaos you know um uh so for for uh for uh higgins i think that you know mentorship really pays off you know it's um and he enjoys the sharing of of that story about chet baker um i i remember when chet baker died because i was in a play with um a fantastic my favorite british actor actually ian hart and he was such a massive chet baker fan and we were doing a tiny we were doing voicek in a really small studio in the middle of nowhere and uh he, he talked about chet baker every day and, and i and that i hadn't really didn't really know who chet baker was then and then he came in and said he had a Liverpool accent. Chet Baker's dead. He's dead. I can't believe it. Um, so, um, he, so Chet Baker, for even for me, is uh, is embedded because uh, you know I sort of got excited by him, got intrigued by him. Only, only weeks later, he died. Uh, so it's um, yeah, it was completely appropriate. You know. I I also love the fact that we get to watch Higgins kind of taking front and center stage quite literally because he's someone who doesn't always kind of need to take flowers for everything that he does for other people. He's kind of always there kind of like being everybody's wingman, lifting everyone up and, and it's not necessarily always kind of noticed and acknowledged and he doesn't feel a need to bring it to the foreground either. Um, and so for you, what did that mean to Higgins to kind of be in a space where he's standing there and he's having that sort of reception from an audience and from a crowd around him? Oh, I think it's incredibly uplifting. And, and it's, it's very true what you say about him because yeah, he doesn't crow about, you know, these things, but, you know, he got the sports uh, therapist on board and, you know, the, the very first, 
person who was uh who went to see him was was, was of course uh colin and uh and it wasn't until the amsterdam episode that you know and he where he was sort of when he came out to trent that you you realize that that that's that's the process that he's been going on and that's something that higgins initiated and of course it it, it helped with ted enormously as well and he brought zava on board um so yeah there are some very key uh <laughs> storylines that uh stem from higgins initiation uh so um but yeah no it's so uh, but i think that jazz wise i think he's probably just he plays in small clubs or just for a few friends or just for the fun of it um so to uh to actually go on stage with a with a packed house is inc an incredible thrill i think for him and once you knew what the piece was um you know you obviously began rehearsing it and, it, and i believe you you know you were working with your double bla your double bass um mentor and and teacher on that piece but what was the difference in terms of the way that you were working with your teacher not just in okay I want to learn how to play this particular piece in and, and perform it well but I want to think about how would Higgins perform and play this and and what would he look like on stage doing this uh, <laughs> I think um given that I haven't done it very much myself uh he'd look a bit like me <laughs> um so but I uh, I looked a bit, I, I was a bit nervous doing it actually, um, but I looked a bit cooler than I thought I did. I thought I might look a little bit, um, I'm sure Matt would have told me, the director would have told me if, if, you know, would have took me aside. Um, but um, no, I think it brought out, um, uh, looking at it, it was, it was like um, some, a mixture of fun and concentration that you, you know, you, people have when they're, they, they're, you know, really in tune with playing playing music with other people. Um, so hopefully that seemed plausible <laughs> as Higgins. And in terms of, of, of another moment that really felt like it meant something to Higgins was going back to the Christmas episode in season two. And it's that thing where Higgins and his wife, they've, they've opened up their house and they've offered for the players to come every single year. But that's the first time where they've ended up with an entire football team in the middle of their living room. And there was something really beautiful in it. And even just the fact that Higgins, when he's giving a speech, he's not just calling out their countries that they're from. It's like he pays enough attention to the details that he's calling out their hometowns, their home cities specifically um, in kind of talking about the idea of them all being together. And so for you, what did that moment mean to him as a character in terms of everybody really showing up and everybody being there in his house in, in a way that, you know, he's had a couple of players before, but never to that extent. I think, um, I think it meant a lot. It was an acknowledgement of his role um, and his in, in increasing uh, his gravitas and his his um, what he did did for the club, because in the very first season, you know he goes to give high fives to the the the, the whole team and they pretty much blank him. So uh, you know, I, and I thought it again it was a it's a really feasible idea from Joe Kelly that. Uh, you know, footballers don't have a lot of time off. That you know, it's a there are so many um, leagues and uh, and so many games that that to have a, you know, if you're if you're from a different continent, it's going to be impossible to get back. And who do you spend time with at this you know holiday time? So um, it was it, that that was so, because of the plausibility again of that. Um, it, it just all made sense and I think it really was an uplift for for Higgins the character and, and it allowed him to to you know as you said to see the detail and the and the the concentration that he gives his job and to the whole team and the whole idea of the the family that you make along the way what a great line you know that's what we do and in going into filming the, this final episode of, of the most recent season with, with everybody saying goodbye to Ted and, and really looking back for Higgins in terms of everything that that has meant to him and, and all the growth that he's had as a character, when you knew that that was the point at which the show was building to, 
where did you want Higgins journey to kind of carry him to, you know, going back to that idea of, of how he's really developed and grown so much over the, over the last few seasons. I think it's the thrill of seeing the team win. You know, it's his ultimate goal. It's a boyhood sort of fantasy. My um, backstory for Higgins is that he wanted to be a player, but was, you know, terrible at it. Um, And he was a huge fan of Richmond and that he, he decided at an early age, that's what he would do. He would work for Richmond Um, and so that's my, that's my personal motivation. And I think it makes sense that that's what it's about. And so the joy of seeing the team win is a kind of, it's the boyhood fantasy. It's the little boy inside Higgins that is having his dream fulfilled. And for you on a personal level, what, what was the emotional space of, of coming in and, and filming those final scenes, particularly in, in the final moments that you had with Jason on screen? Um, wow. It was, um, it was, it was very beautiful. Um, at, at the end of the day, you're just trying to get the scene right, whatever, whatever its status is in, you know, I, television history. Um, but I think the actual, the actual last day, which in which I thought, um, I was going to do a scene and then I didn't. So I was hanging around and my daughter came on set as well. And then the, I think the last scene that was shot was, um, going to not well up (laughs) the footballers, you know, watching which turns out to be a really bad idea for them i think uh you know they're, they're what the history that they've gone and they're all tearing up and of course we were watching them watching themselves which is you know it's all a bit meta um so and then that day and then and then um that was the last scene and we were all on set in the locker room and uh jason and brendan stood on a table like sort of Roman conquerors <laughs> and and Jason made an uh, of course incredible impromptu speech about the fact that the show is working its own magic is perpetuating positivity beyond uh, the, the 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 realm of of what we have created uh, you know so um and that was wow that was just an incredible day and it was very moving I mean, it, it, it is an incredible show and I love everything that you've brought into such a, such a wonderful character throughout the last few seasons. And it's been such a joy watching your performance. So thank you so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate talking to you oh, today. Thank you. Great chat. Thank you.